Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door podcast. And um, I keep saying it because I have these incredibly unique guests that managed to, to say yes to me. Uh, Trisha Brooke, I had to chase her for a while. She's a super busy woman. Uh, but Trisha, thank you for doing this and welcome. Please tell us who you are. Zev, thank you so much for having me here with you today. I am super, super excited. I have been living and working in New York City for the past 30 years. I moved to New York from Arnold, Missouri to pursue a career in dance. I knew that I was going to dance all over the world. I was seven years old, started dancing, became obsessed with Gelsey Kirkland and the Nutcracker and Misha Barishnikov. And it took me to New York City. I had a very successful career here, dancing all over the world with Lucinda Childs, Big Dance Theater, David Gordon, and uh, danced at Lincoln Center, uh, performed in Paris, in Portugal, in Italy, and uh, one day decided I was going to move on from dance, and I produced a solo dance concert. And it was uh, compiled of all of my solos, all the solos that choreographers had made on me over the years, along with several pieces that I made for myself. And I describe it, Zev, like a Zen sand sculpture, a mandala, where the Buddhist monks create the mandala with sand with different colors. And they take a long time to do it. And it's very mindful and thoughtful and intentional. And when they're complete, they wipe it away. And that's exactly what my experience was with my dance career. It was complete and I moved on. And that's when I moved into directing, writing, choreographing, producing, and that has led me here to you today. Perfect. There were a couple of tidbits that I was going to dig in. You broke it, but it's good. We're going to put it back together. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is, is sort of start at your early, younger years and kind of find our way through the path that led you to here. You gave us the quick version. Um, I want to dig a little bit deeper as we speak. So if we met at when you were 12 and I asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Did you know then? Absolutely. I was crystal clear from the moment I saw my sister dance on a stage that I was going to be a, a dancer. I was devoted to the art and to the practice and absolutely without a doubt had no hesitation in what I knew about being a dancer. Were, were your parents in the entertainment? Well, it, I, I'm not gonna call dancing entertainment. We'll get to that later. Were your par parents artists or this was completely left field stuff? My parents were not artists and they were extremely supportive of taking me to dance class. And remember, I wanted to be a ballerina, not just a dancer. I wanted to be a ballerina. And that means point shoes. Point shoes were 35, 40 bucks a pop. And I'd go through them every three weeks. So this was a devotion, not only by me, but of my parents. Wow. So, so this was an early age and you obviously stuck with it because you go on to get a BFA in dance, but look, I'm, I'm not an expert on dance, but the ballerina piece is very competitive, isn't it? It's very, very competitive. And it's also very emotionally challenging. And the reason I say that is because it is athletic, A, creative, B, and you have to have a certain body type. And it really is something that is, is very challenging for any young woman when she goes through puberty to all of a sudden fit into that mold of super thin. And that was very challenging for me because I like cheese <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I had a healthy relationship to food. I was never depriving myself. And so what I realized is, wait a minute, I've got extremely good technique because of all of my ballet training and there's modern dance. I can take off my point shoes 
and still do a triple pirouette and still have extension and beautiful feet, that's what I want to do. So uh, the, the only reason I bragged about my limited knowledge about the ballerina is because, and you probably know her, there was, there's a Ukrainian, or it was a Russian ballerina that just defected because of what's going on in Ukraine. And she was already always everywhere in the news and everybody was raving about her as, as an amazing uh, ballerina. And I got to see some of the stuff she was doing. Uh, it hurts just to watch it because it's doing this on your toes. Um, but, uh, you know, I've done high level sports and, and my kids did the same, but some of their friends were one of these really crazy athletic type, the swimmers, especially where the parents would be shuttling them all over the place, literally every day from swim meets to practice. Uh, my point being, when you're that young and you commit to something, you have to put in incredible amount of hours to get to be good. It's not like you're going to spin around and then go around and play with somebody else, right? right. It's, it's a real commitment. It is a real commitment. And because my passion for creative expression through the technique specifically of ballet, I took tap class, I took jazz class, I was doing gymnastics, all of it at my dance school. What I was so excited about was this art form of ballet, the technique, the turnout, the, the, the way the body looked in the specific shapes of ballet. That is what I was so committed to. And I would get home from dance class at 9 p.m. and I would study for a while and then sleep, take a nap from midnight to 2 a.m. and then get up and finish my homework so I could go back to school the next morning with my homework completed. And then after school, I would go to ballet class or I would go to dance class or I, would, I was on scholarship. So I would go teach classes to the younger kids so I could take as many classes as possible for free. Because again, point shoes are expensive. So for me, it was normal to have that kind of discipline and grit and tenacity. And what I've come to know now is how it serves me as an entrepreneur. Right. I, I was, you, you're, you, you're almost like a, a 30 second ahead of me, which is great because I was going to get to that. Uh, and, and the whole idea of, of my podcast is to take someone who's successful, but kind of peel, peel back the onion. And when we look back, as we often do, as we get older, we look back at our sort of like life journey. And then you, you think about it and you say, yeah, that makes sense. This was all leading me to where I wind up. Well, um, let me share with you. And I think this will also um, be interesting for you as a, uh, the leader or facilitator of this conversation is that it wasn't easy. I, I was turned down at auditions and in dance competition all the time. My best friend at dance school was the one chosen. I got second place or first runner up a lot. Yeah. And so, you know, I was going to, I, I want to share with you a story about my son, but, but it, it's related, right? So he was discovered in middle school as a very talented musician by his music teacher. And he said, and he was a saxophone player, you should get him a private teacher. He's very, very talented. So we did. And I went to every lesson with him. And as he matured uh, and got to be really good, he was taught by master musicians, internationally renowned people. And, and I was there. I was always sitting in the back at all because music for me, I love music. And jazz was one of the things I love. So my son becoming a jazz musician was amazing. But what was interesting, every single master musician that worked with me always said, are you sure you want to do this? because it's a really, really tough way to make a living. And there was one particular bass player, I, I forgot his name, but he's, he played with everyone. Uh, he said, and, and he said to him, look, you're really, really good kid, but if you wanna make it, you have to play. You have to just go and play and don't get picky. 
And this guy was phenomenal. And he said, you go play on bar mitzvahs and weddings and cruise ships. And you play. Because if you think you're hot shit and you're going to sit at home and wait for somebody to call you, it's never going to happen. So fast forward, we're looking at colleges and some really, really top music colleges. And he gets cold feet. And I remember the conversation that maybe I should just do something else because they all told me, why go through all this trouble and go to these schools if I'm not going to be able to, to make money and, and make a living? And I remember saying to him, uh, Ilan, what does this music mean to you? What is this about? And he looked at me and he said, it's everything, dad. And I said, then just, just go do this, okay? Don't, I, I don't want you to ever look back and regret it. Just go do it. And the reason I tell you that story is because I'm sure because of the, the competitive nature of anything in the arts, whether it's a painter or a singer or an actor, and then a jazz musicians, an incredibly struggling, challenging niche genre within music. Uh, and you go into ballerina class, comp, you know, performance, which is, well, I don't know what percentage of dancers wind up being ballerina, but I'm assuming it's pretty small. I'm, I'm, it's very small. Right. It's very, very specific niche for sure. So what, did you ever have like, like my son style doubts where I don't know where this is taking me and am I going to make a career out of it one day? Eventually you did, but were there any doubts, especially when your friends get, your, your best friend gets picked and you're second, right? That's devastating. That is devastating. And it was also something that created my, one of my values, which is humility. Because it wasn't, it wasn't, no, it was not yet. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great line. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not yet. So you, you make it. You, you wind up dancing all around the world with some great people. Um, when was the point where, actually, you know what, I'm going to pause because I don't like to read at people's bios when I start because I, I want to kind of make it more mysterious. But um, before I ask you the next question of how did you wind up there, I want to read a piece of your bio. Um, I worked in theater, film, and television for over three decades. I worked on Black Box on ABC, The Affair on Showtime. I watched it. Rescue Me on Fox, closely with John Torturo's Romance and Cigarettes, where I was awarded the Golden Thumb Award from Roger Ebert for my choreography. I had the privilege of working closely with my friend, one of my heroes. I was living for that show. The late James Gandolfini, Eddie Izzard, and Steve Buscemi. I also made several appearances in the film, and you can catch it on Amazon Prime. So that's a pretty big departure from dance, right? How'd you wind up there? That's a great question. I was... planning to go back to school to become a physical therapist because I was becoming disillusioned from the dance, the dance world. I'd auditioned for everyone. I was starting to hear not yet a lot. And I thought, okay, I'm, I, I'm not 25 anymore. What am I going to do? And I went through the whole process of getting into school and I got a call from someone that I knew from the dance world who said, I teach John Turturro Pilates and he's looking for a choreographer for a movie. And I gave him your name. And the next day I got a call from John Turturro. Can you meet me at Brooklyn Academy of Music and we can talk about this film? And I went to BAM and as I'm walking down the hallway, I'd been there a million times auditioning for Mark Morris. I was walking down the hallway and Susan Sarandon passes me in the hallway. And I thought, that's interesting. Wonder what Susan Sarandon's doing here. Walk into a very small studio. John Turturro's in there with 
a video, rec- one of those video laptops. We can all watch videos on our phones now, but that didn't exist then. <laughs> and, and he said, I'm, I'm doing a movie. And he gave me the synopsis and he said, I want to know if you'd be willing to dance around the room in the scene that Kate Winslet's going to be playing, her name's Tula, with a bunch of firefighters. And I want you to pretend like you're fire, like you're on fire, like you're, you're really hot and you're on fire. And I said, okay, what did I have to lose? So in come all these literally real New York City firefighters in their gear. He puts on the Buena Vista Social Club and I start dancing, improvising around the room. And the next thing I know, I'm working on romance and cigarettes. And, and the rest is history. Then you spend how many more, how many years in this area in entertainment as a generic term? I'm still in this entertainment area, um, working on a new Broadway musical currently and writing another off-Broadway play. So you went from sort of what I, I, to me, uh, dance is more of an intimate way of, of, it's an intimate way of art, right? Where, you know, a painter has the canvas and it's the painter in the canvas. For you, and again, you have, I mean, dancers have partners, obviously, but it, to me, it's always been, it's together, but it's separate. You you have your own uh, artistic expression when you dance on the stage, even if you have a partner. So you make the transition from really being in touch with your body, in touch with the music, the choreography. Now now you're on a, a much bigger stage. It's a, it's a totally different thing, right? It's It's a transition. Choreography is really another expression of what it means to be a dancer. I'm not saying all dancers can choreograph at all. Most of them cannot. What I was able to do, and I didn't know that I could, was channel the work. And the reason I say I didn't know I could is because I was never asked to choreograph anything before until that movie. I was catapulted into not only choreographing an entire feature film that was a musical, not just background movement, but it was also a medium I had not worked in before, which means I had zero experience. And when I said yes to John, it was because I knew I could without knowing I could. I just knew it. I said yes, because I knew I would A, run home immediately and start to listen to the music, close my eyes and start to visualize what the characters would do and how they would move because it's storytelling and the characters are going to tell me how they move. And then I would allow my physicality as a dancer to create that vocabulary. So yes, it was different, but it was very much still in my wheelhouse of skill. So this, this is a podcast about entrepreneurship and, and success stories. Uh, and clearly you were successful, but I think what you just said before uh, was very interesting. So entrepreneurs are risk takers. Uh, sometimes they take the risk, but they're not ready for it. Uh, and then they fail. So 80% of startups go away within a few years. You said you were confronted with something you didn't know how to do, but you knew you could do it. Where does that come from? And, and again, my, my questions will lead us eventually to speaking, but it, I'm, I'm building it up slowly. Where does that conviction come from? It comes from every step I took as a dancer and the not yet's. It came from every step I took as, as, a, as the first runner up to my best friend to the tenacity, the grit, the discipline. I was never someone who was entitled. Hmm. Brilliant. And, and, and there lies the difference because I work with entrepreneurs and have been in this field forever. 
Um, everybody can think they can do it because we all grow up on the I think I can book, you know, the little engine that could. Um, it's not necessarily true. I mean, it's not a bad thing to repeat as a mantra, I think I can. But at some point, uh, you do have to step aside and say, okay, I think I can, but do I have the qualifications or the training? Have I done anything that can allow me now to take that leap that you took by doing something you haven't done before? But like you said, but you've already proven something prior to it. So this was, this was not a uncalculated risk. It was risky, but on a basis of, yeah, I look back at history and I know what I've, what I've done from age 12 through this point. I can handle it. Right. right. It, Right. And that was the body of evidence that I had created. If we go back to, I think I can for a minute, I want to just talk about that because I am someone who is very much connected to source. I study universal law. And when you think you can do something, that is you not owning the, the truth that you know you can. And I want to ask your listeners to reframe. If you practice the mantra, I'm doing my best, or I think I can, you're limiting yourself because your best isn't good enough. And thinking you can means you don't believe you can. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it, to me, it's sort of like an artificial feel good. You, when you hear yourself say it, the way we are wired, uh, it's like a, a looping mechanism, right? You hear yourself say, it, I think I can. And now you relax and you feel a little bit better about it. But that's artificial because you still have to do the work, right? That's why when somebody says the words that I absolutely despise, fake it till you make it, I, I just can't tell you, I kind of blow up when I hear that because it's it's so stupid. It's just impractical, you know? And uh, you can fake it till you make it, but if you think that people don't realize that you're faking it, then you're an idiot because it's pretty obvious. It's not that hard to tell when somebody's faking it. How do you really feel, Zeph? <laughs> uh, listen, you you got me going. I'm I'm out there. That's it. Um, so so now you're in a, in a different world. You you jump into the entertainment universe with choreography and musicals and incredible celebrities, successful actors, uh, and you're saying you're still in it. Um, but when was the point that you sort of, you didn't quite move the way you sort of decided to go into a parallel universe and you adapted this, this public speaking business? When did that happen? What prompted that? A few years ago, a friend of mine who'd come to all of my shows, Petra Kolber, she landed a TED Talk and she asked me to work with her on it. And I thought, oh, that sounds super fun. It'll be just like a one woman show. We'll work on script analysis, choreography, blocking, intention. I'll work with you just like I do my actors. And that's how I approached it, like a one woman show. And it was really successful. It was so enjoyable. I loved working with her because her talk was inspiring. And I felt like I was being coached during our time together because all of what she was saying was something I could ap apply to my own life. Her talk was about the perfection detox. Didn't think anything about it afterwards. Supported her, cheered her on, was watching from afar. And she planted the seed that I should do this. And I thought, do what? This is a thing? Speakers have coaches? There's a, there's a whole online space? I had zero idea that this online space existed or that there was coaching at all. Interesting. And, and the other thing that I find interesting, challenging for me is um, choreography I get. But working with someone on, on how to speak, that's a different skill set. Because as a dancer, you don't speak. You just, you're out there. You perform. Choreography is not speaking. It's movement, right? 
uh, it's a different form expression, but to go on, get on stage and use all the tools that speakers need to have, and we'll, we'll dig a little bit into it in a few minutes, but that's a different skill set. So, but you connected the dots there. Well, I connected the dots by moving from dancer to choreographer and then moving from choreographer to director. And when I was a director, that's when I began to understand script analysis. And I studied with Seth Barish at the Barrow Group and learned how to analyze a script, learned from him, watching him direct the actors, how to direct. And when I took the direct, a directing class with him here in New York City, what was so fascinating is that learning how to be a good and effective and compassionate and caring director translated into me being a better wife. Hmm. I learned how to communicate in a way that was not combative, <laughs> that was creating a safe space always. And so I, I, I did have a very solid period of time where I learned how to direct actors to speak through characters. And that is what has taught me how to use the exact same, same techniques with my speakers. And it's interesting because when I teach them the art of object, objective in action, which is Mamet teaches it, it is something we as human beings do every day. What do you want from somebody? How do you get it? You want your kid to go to sleep? That's your objective. How do you get them to do it? Well, you could bribe them. That's an action. You could take them. That's another action. You could tickle them. That's another action. And that's the exact same technique that I use with my speak, my actors. And I just apply that to my speakers. Hmm. Fascinating. So, um, this might sound like a stupid question, but, um, I think you were saying that, that, the, the art of speaking has a lot to do with stage presence and communicating. So can someone be a really, really good speaker, but absolutely suck at what they talk about? Yes. Absolutely. Um, and it can go either way. You can have really awesome material and suck at performing that material. Mm -hmm. What's important here is they need to be congruent in order to be a great speaker. And if you understand the art of script writing and you know how to write a powerful talk that has a through line and an arc and a solid call to action, and you understand the art of choreography, when to move and when to be still, and you understand that it's not about you, it's about being of service to the audience. And if you want their attention, and if you want them to think differently, it's your job as the speaker to relentlessly go after that. If they're not paying attention, change what you're doing. If they're not nodding their heads yes, because they are on board with what you're saying, you as the speaker have to relentlessly go after that until you get it. Yeah, it's interesting because um, obviously I'm, not in that universe, but for six years, I was graduate marketing professor at, at a graduate school in the city. And um, I found that, that my excitement about teaching came directly from my students. And, if, and that's why I was very hands-on and in their face constantly in class, because that's what got me going. Because mm -hmm. to stand there, like some of my professors with a textbook and start to read something and start putting up PowerPoints with 17 bullets, uh, I, I would be miserable doing it and they'll be miserable watching it. So uh, I think that's what you're kind of referring to, right? In, in read the audience, um, you can prepare, but, but you still want, you need to adjust, right? It's a dance, it's a there scene, it's a dance, right. it's a pas de deux and it's a scene. You've got someone else there with you. So, so you, you get into this, somebody plants a seed in your head and said, I think you should do this. Um, how do you turn this into a business? 
The first thing that I did was hire someone to teach me about online marketing and to teach me about visibility and credibility. I was not on Facebook. I did not have an Instagram account. I did not know about funnels or lists or newsletters. I literally knew nothing. My first coach I brought on and she taught me about visibility. And I was uh, working with her and she was colleagues with John Lee Dumas. So on one of those calls, he said, you have zero online credibility. Start a podcast, do three episodes, talk about what you do. So that was the first thing I did. I started a podcast. Of course, I recorded 20 episodes and we're, we're up to like 481 now. That was the first thing I did. I realized, oh, I do have something to say about this whole speaking thing through the lens of a performer, through the lens of a theater person, through the lens of a filmmaker and a director. Started interviewing speakers. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, I had all these people coming to me for speaking coaching. And I knew how to write a script. And it was the same way I taught them to write their speech. And before I knew it, I had all these speakers, no place to put them. And I thought, I've, I've got to put them on a stage. What's the best stage for speakers? TEDx. So I applied to TEDx was given a license to TEDx, became the executive producer of TEDx Lincoln Square, produced my first event. And it was then because of that level of credibility, because of their brand, that I was able to really start the ball rolling of my business. Is, is TEDx the, the ultimate prize for somebody who's starting as who wants to be a speaker? you get that stamp of approval does that is is it that powerful it is it is that powerful it is a stamp of approval it is uh, a platform that will give you the kind of visibility that you desire it will get people to call you back if you lead with i'm a ted speaker most people will give you credibility because it's so difficult to become a ted speaker even tedx are they are they that tough TEDx, even TEDx, yes. Yeah, Yeah. because I know regular TED is probably really, really hard, but TEDx are more regional and they're equally as selective then. They are, because there's so many speakers who want to take those stages. Right, which brings me to my my next story. And and when I, 10 10 years ago in two months, you know, walked away from, you know, a really nice high executive position and I wanted to do this, all my life, but I always tell people didn't have the courage to do it while I had kids that had to go to college. I didn't want to risk anything that had to do with them. So when my youngest daughter was finishing nursing school, I said, okay, I have arrived time for me to do this. And I quit literally new year's Eve, 2012. I quit. Um, but I spent my entire career on planes, flying around the world, flying the U S um, now I'm an entrepreneur, no idea what that means. I was introduced to business coaching, which I thought was a phenomenal, brilliant concept. And I said, so what do I do now? Uh, I had a pretty nice following. I was successful. A lot of people knew me and I figured, okay, I'm just going to hang that, that shingle on the door and people will line up and come hire me. And as lawyers say, nothing could be further than the truth. Nobody showed up. And I had a, a rude awakening that when you disconnected from the mothership, as in you're no longer part of a corporation, you're on your own, blank slate, doesn't matter what you've done, you have to start from scratch. So I asked for advice, and this is what everybody told me. I live on Long Island, different universe than the city, but that's what they told me. You have to network. I said, okay, I know what that is. You have to write a book, and you have to go become a speaker. And I said, what does that mean? I just call the chambers and call associations and tell them you want to speak. And I said, okay, I like speaking. So the writing book piece has got a little bit more commitment and difficult. So the speaking part's easy. What I didn't know 
is that everybody and their cousin three times removed was also wanted to be a speaker, right? That, to your point. Um, so there's something about speaking that is valuable, which when you're on a stage, it gives you sort of credibility, your quote unquote authority figure. Although I would say 90% of the time when I was exposed to speakers, they were really terrible. Um, maybe they had a golden resume, but they're horrible speakers. And many, many times, especially in my early days as an entrepreneur, yeah, you go to a chamber meeting and you know, got a guy sitting there. We, yesterday was a troop leader in the scouts and today he's something else and he's standing there. It, it wasn't, I got some speaking engagement, but it, obviously it's not that. But my point is, I think what you said, right? Everybody wants to be a speaker. But my question to Tricia Brooke is, what should you know before, uh, here's my so here's the, the the first question. Can you take anyone and turn them into a brilliant, engaging, successful speaker, or do you need something there first in order to to turn them into that? What I need there first is for their desire to share their story to be in the forefront. And that means they're not desiring to be a speaker. They're desiring to share their story. And if they come to the table with that alignment and intention, if they do the work, show up, literally do the work that I'm going to teach them how to do, they can become captivating speakers. Not everyone is willing to do the work. And that's why I can't promise that I can make anybody into a speaker. However, if you know in your heart that sharing your powerful story is going to impact the lives of people and maybe just one person, and that's what you wake up to every morning, yes, you can get to being a captivating speaker. And if you are at all worried about how you look doing it, you can't get to being a captivating speaker. So we, we all might think that we have a cool story to share, but more often than not, it's gonna be average. It's, it's not that unique. So do you, do you filter it out and say to someone, ah, listen, you, you have a story, but honestly, you just like, it's not gonna do it. I think that one of my superpowers is the ability to listen to someone's story and hone in on what makes it special. And I'll say this because four years ago, an amazing doctor, Dr. Sonia Chopra came to me and she's an endodontist. She does root canals for a living. And she said, I really want to talk about this, but I just don't think anybody cares. And I said, Sonia, I can make, you are going to talk about root canals and you're going to make them sexy. And I can make that happen for you. Cut to four years later. She didn't believe me. Cut to four years later. She came back and said, I'm ready. And she did a Ted talk on root canals. And let me tell you, she made them sexy. Everybody who saw that talk, trust me, made an appointment to go see their dentist. <laughs> So I think what is really remarkable is you may not think you have a powerful story, but you do. And it just takes the right person. And it doesn't have to be me to listen to you share it and to distill that one moment that is powerful. So there, there are, and I think this is really important to, for my audience, because just like I said, everybody who owns a business who aren't, is an entrepreneur, they, everybody wants to get on stage because, I, I, and I think it's a myth. The myth is that if you get on stage, not the TED Talk stage, um, for somehow this is going to propel you into you know, stardom and people are going to come chasing you and buy your books and hire you. Um, I, I wish it was true, but there's so many speakers out there you still have to, in, in my world in marketing, 
you still have to find a way to, as you said, extract that unique story so it doesn't sound and, and reads like someone else's. And then you teach them, you work on a technique on the stage presence and how to connect and how to say it. Um, but look, when I, six years of, of graduate school teaching and teaching marketing and entrepreneurship and leadership, everybody's petrified of public speaking. Right? I don't know what the statistics are, but next to maybe death, taxes, and divorce, the next one is probably public speaking. And my students had to, every single one on a weekly basis, rotating, had to present a case study to the class. Mm. And I had students that come in and say, I can't do it. I can't. You don't understand. I'm not going to sleep at night. I'm going to I'm going to have diarrhea. I, I, I can't. I can't. And I said, I, I sympathize with you, but you're going to do it or you fail the class. And they got up there and then we cheered them on and we said, look, the, the students in the class, we're going to give you constructive feedback on what you can improve. I never tell them what you did wrong. These are the things you can improve. Um, and there was one student in particular that was absolutely petrified. He told me his dad told him, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. And I told him, go back to your dad and say, you just paid for a class. Your son, your son just failed. Mm. And I made him do it. And at the end of the class, for their mass for their final project he not i didn't tell him to do it he went out with the microphone and walked around the city and talked to strangers and interviewed them and it was a phenomenal transformation transformation it's not to do with me i'm not taking credit for it but my point is it's petrifying right you got to get over the stage fright you got to over the fact that you're standing in front of people and talking and then, oh, by the way, you need to remember what you need to talk about and deliver it in a way that's engaging. That's a lot of work for you, isn't it? It is. And it's so rewarding to watch someone learn how to coexist with fear. And that's really what you're doing. If you care about what you're saying, you're going to have anxiety. You're going to have fear. If you don't care about what you're saying and you don't have any nerves, then I would rethink why you're doing this. Being able to coexist with fear means you make it about the audience rather than having the thoughts, what if I fail? What if I stutter? What if I fall? What if I forget? What if I faint? Well, what if you don't? What if you change someone's life? What if you inspire someone to take action? What if you get a standing ovation? And that's what I teach my actors. It's got to be about the audience. Once you stop thinking about yourself, that fear can take a back seat and you can deliver the material in service of the audience. It's interesting because it's all about the, you know, the way we're wired, the, the fight or flight mechanism where the fear gets us to say things, you know, the voices in our head, or even if we repeat it openly, which is really just excuses to at the end to say, I'm not doing it right? Because then it, then the stress is gone and you feel good about it. I don't have to do it. But, you know, the, the get out, it's not just get out of your comfort zone, but conquer your fear and, and just go. But the way, I think the way you're positioning it is brilliant because instead of talking about yourself so much, it isn't about you, which is my marketing message to anybody. It's not about you. It's about the customer. So it's about your audience, right? Uh, if you impact one person in the audience and you'll know when that happens, because that person will come to you after the talk with tears in their eyes and tell you, you changed their life, right? Happened yes. to you happened to you plenty of time, I'm sure. Yes. yes and then yes. you don't need more than one, right? Because that's, that's a validation for you as a person, first of all, not as a speaker. As a then, human, right. As a human, and then as a speaker that you, you're effective and you touch one life, that's, that's fine. Right, right. We, we all have these dreams about, you know, the um, the secret, right? We want to be the, the secret thing. No, just take it one step at a time. It's okay. And there's something I'd love to add, Zev, which is you are in service of the audience. It's not about you. And I talk about the urgency and the responsibility of being a speaker. You also are speaking for those who can't. Hmm. And if we're talking about Ukraine and Russia right now, they can't. So we must. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And I have a speaker who was terrified 
such terrible stage fright. He would take the stage and he would grimace and he would sweat and he would shake. And his entire platform is around being a vegan. And I said, James, you have to speak for the animals. They can't. Hmm. Well, that's a higher purpose, right? It's, it's an, another reason why people are vegans, but you're right. So you dig in. Uh, again, a, another word I don't use and don't like is passion. It's forget about passions. It's really the purpose, right? Mm -hmm. um, why are you doing this? Uh, start with internally, what do I want to share and how's it going to impact people? So your look, just like in my world of marketing and business coaching, which is uh, is saturated with hordes of people who are average and unimpressive and ruin it for the rest of us who are really good in what they do we do um I, I think that and i've come across not a lot but enough people who are speaking coaches and promise you the world and you know it's a three months program and you're gonna have to do the work and it's really expensive for somebody who is not committed to it um but I think the, turn, the thing that turned me off, and I turned a couple of them down because at some point I thought about doing it, uh, it, it just came across too commercialized for me. Uh, you're different. You're, you're the real thing. I mean, I, um, my audience can't see you, but you're very genuine. You, you, you talk about it in a way that, that's meaningful, which now makes you congruent for me because we haven't met before when I'm going about to read your mission statement, which is not easy to read because there's a ton in it, right? Um, your mission on your website, being a loving and honest beacon of light and support in order to elevate, transform, and create a safe space that will illuminate the powerful stories of people and inspire greater humanity in the world. You just laid this out in the last 40 minutes, okay? Uh, I wasn't, I didn't read this on purpose. I waited till later on. You, you did it. It's not over yet. Together, we give birth to an army of heart-centered, authentic communicators who speak with dignity and authenticity. By getting this kind of clarity on your big idea and how to captivate your audience every time, you will have the kind of impact that creates long-lasting ripple effects. So to me, the best part here is the ripple effects because, right, you just don't know, right? You don't know. It's like you throw that stone and it's a ripple effect. It's, it's, I remember I read this. It's not really a story, but kind of a story. And then it resonated with me. And then I wrote, I wrote a blog about it. It's called the butterfly effect. Sure. Right. Oh, this yeah. is what it's about, right? You know, yes. I, I think it starts with like the wing of a bird somewhere in Singapore can create a hurricane in New York. Yes. Um, the impact of, you know, little motion, little things, the ripple effect, you don't know where it's going to wind up. You just right. have no idea. A lot of times it's unfortunately the words and I'm as guilty when we use the wrong words and we say the wrong things. Uh, but in this particular discussion, I think I started by saying that everybody and their cousin three times removed wants to be a speaker. And the question is, should anybody in, the, in my audience who are entrepreneurs and, and business people, I'm sure they want to speak, should they, should they become speaker? And your message is, if you have something to say that is unique that can cause the kind of ripple effect and impact on the audience could be one, but you don't know, uh, then yeah, then go and do it. But don't just do it by getting on stage and blabbing around. The delivery is as important as what you're about to say. It's critical, right? It is critical. And I love the idea of blabbing around as not being a good technique to uh, adopt for speaking. That's very amazing. The other thing I want to say, Zev, is if you want to be a speaker, think about being an influential voice first. And that means how you communicate across the kitchen table to your family. It means how you communicate across the boardroom table to your team or how you communicate at a softball game inside of your community. 
when you are a speaker, it's not limited to being on a stage. When you're an influential voice and you know that what you say has lasting legacy, you need to embody that all the time. And then when you have the privilege of stepping onto a stage, communicating to an audience who is there to learn from you, be inspired by you, be educated by you, be taken care of by you, then all of the speaking that you've done up until this point will be congruent when you take that stage. Right. And, and again, I've learned the word congruence, about congruency 10 years ago in business coaching training. Uh, it's a really powerful word, but I don't think people really understand what that means. And I'll explain it, but you tell me if I'm wrong. Congruency really means walk the walk, talk the talk, right? So if you say something about yourself on your website, and then I meet you and you're a complete jerk, then you're not congruent, right? Um, and But the key, I think that the, everything you said about speaking, uh, the thing that resonates with me is the the authentic, the authentic part, right? Uh, because we're all being trained and coached, particularly if you go through a corporate world, you have to be a certain way and you have to say certain things and you have to behave in a certain way and don't break anything and, you know, follow the herd if, you know, that's the safe space. And my entire life has always been just the opposite. The herd goes right, I go left. Um, and if you want to be a speaker and you have something to say, then just have the courage to go say it. You're not looking for acceptance, right, Trish? You're, oh looking, you're not looking for acceptance. You're looking to share and then let them decide. Right. If, with it. if you're looking for accolades and adoration, you're, in the, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. It's, it's got to be about being of service. And when you're clear on that, you'll become a better speaker. Yeah, it's interesting. Like in, in the words of my mentor, I'm not going to mention his name because it's name dropping and he's really, really famous. You can see his books behind me. Um, but I, I remember when I, I called him and I said, hey, I'm writing a book. How do I get it to be a bestseller? And as soon as I finished saying it, I realized, what an idiot. You know what he's going to say. Why did you even do this? And his answer to me was, why would you want to, right? And his entire philosophy about marketing and communication in particular is, if you have something to say, just say it. It doesn't matter how many likes you get. It doesn't matter how many engagement you get. Um, it, it's, it's a tough thing to cross when you work really hard on something and then three people like it. Uh, it's, it I, I, I'll be honest, it's disappointing. Um, I wrote a blog the other day about Mother Teresa on LinkedIn, which is not the typical blog you see. Um, and two days before, I, I posted a picture of my daughter's dog, who's a multi-pool, about a different topic. The dog won, hands down. <laughs> they couldn't care less about the, the Mother Teresa part. It was, was an interesting twist. It wasn't really about her. It's about acts of kindness and who's the mother Teresa in your life. You don't even know who she is because yeah. the younger guys don't even know who she was. But the dog won. You know, it's like, this is not Facebook, this is LinkedIn. Right. So, so it's interesting. So Trish, when, when you look back at your journey, any regrets? What would you do different? I would vet the people I hire a little more closely. Mm. And yeah. that coaches and team members. We, we, we all make the same mistake. Um, look, when, when people hire me, just I'm sure you, you might go through the same thing, right? The first question some people ask, well, how soon before I see big results in my business? Uh, in your case might be, well, if I get, how soon before people book me to go speaking in Vegas in the association of porta party manufacturers, right? Whatever the thing is. Um, my answer to them is, I don't know. I'm not a magician, but it really, it's really up to you. Are you a good student? Are you going to follow? Are, you, are we going to connect and you're going to do the work? Um, so that, that's sort of like the message to everyone. You have to do the work, right? Um, and it's tough to vet people 
because they have a website and they have testimonials and you can call some references. I don't know anybody in the universe that ever given bad references to somebody to call. Uh, and what I say to people is, look, you're going to have to risk it with me, not for a long time. You'll find out very quickly whether I know what I'm doing and where we connect it. Um, same thing with you probably, right? You'll find out very quickly whether I know what I'm doing or not. And I'm not promising you overnight success, but I promise you that if you do the work and you're committed to it, you'll begin to see results. When? I don't know. Okay. Right. Um, Something that I started implementing recently in the last year, Zev, is I get references from people who apply to work with me. Mm. I need to know if they're coachable before I say yes to them. Right. That That's smart. I mean, in the corporate world, from people that I put on my teams, they would walk in with a resume and a folder and copies of resume, and I never had a resume in front of me. And they looked and said, would you like a copy of the resume? I said, no. I said, you're not going to go through the resume? And I said, no, I read it. That's why you're here. Right. So why am I here? Because I want to get to know you. Yes. Okay. So let's talk. Who are you? Yeah. Um, which was more important to me than the resume, you know. For people sure. Write, people can write great resumes. And today you can't even call for references anyway because of legal reasons. They're going to say, yeah, I can confirm that he worked here and he was okay. They took the lunch hour every day at 12 o'clock. They never missed. Okay, great. That's that. Um, Trish, one one person in your life that you can look back and say influenced you the most? Karen McGuire, my dance teacher. And we are still very close to this day. Amazing. And one book that you read, one that maybe left an impact. Jack London's Call of the Wild. Wow. So wait, that's Jack London. That's not a, a business book. That he was a... Is that something about the dog or the wolf? I'm trying to remember. This is. Yep. It's about, it's about the dog and Alaska and about the love of, of an, of a master. The dog loved his master so much and his family. And he, he came to love the other dogs of the pack and how he was innately meant to be out in the wild and I read it when I was in school and I read it recently again to one of my friend's daughters. We read every Wednesdays, every Wednesday. And it is such a powerful, beautiful book about loyalty. So is it, is it the dog piece or is it the loyalty? What is it that resonated you so much about the book? It's about the loyalty and it's about the truth. This animal knows, and I can't remember the dog's name right now. Um, he knows who he is and he literally fights to the death to remain in integrity. Hmm. Interesting. I think it would be great if everybody we dealt with was a dog, uh, <laughs> in a good, in a good way, because life is so simple to them, right? They appreciate what they have they They say, thank you. They lick you to death. They'll follow you. Um, there's something about dogs that I've always loved. Um, and I'm, I'm with you. Uh, somebody wrote me an email today and he said, happy Wednesdays. Ed. And I said, you got to be careful when you start an email like that, because you don't know if my Wednesday's happy. My cat just died. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, I'm just kidding. I don't like cats, but I just want to give you an example. That let's Do it differently, right? <laughs> Um, Tricia, it's been awesome. Uh, if somebody wants to find you, where do they go? You can find me at trishabrook.com. I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. And I would love to offer your listeners uh, chapter one of my book, if that's possible, Zev. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, go ahead. You can find, um, you can grab a free complimentary chapter one of the influential voice at the influential voice book.com forward slash chapter. The influential book.com. Influential voice book. Voice, I'm sorry. The influential voice.com. Okay. I'll put this in the show notes. I don't do show notes like everybody else. I'm so impressed that you had John Lee Dumas on, on your show. I just listened to him on one of the best podcasts around it's guy Kawasaki's, uh, 
remarkable people. He was on there. Amazing. Um, really incredible guy, really hard worker. 10 yeah. years it took him to get to where he is. Yep. Just so people get all so impressed by such celebrity celebrity success stories, but they just, just like with Gary V, everybody wants to be Gary V. But if you go listen to his story, he was an incredibly hard worker. Yeah. Incredible. So Trish, thank you so much for doing it. Uh, this was awesome. Thank and, you, Zev. Uh, we'll be in touch through our mutual friend, Amelia, and we'll watch her grow. Thanks to you. Absolutely.